You're here for season seven of the Whole Horse Podcast, now at 110 episodes and counting. I'm your host, Alexa Linton, coming to you from Vancouver Island in Canada. I can't wait to continue to share thought-provoking, edge-pushing, geeky, and often challenging conversations with horse professionals from all areas of our industry who are working to make horses' lives better. This season, you can look forward to more on the specifics of creating enriching, healthy horse spaces, an area I'm particularly passionate about. I'm so excited that you're here listening in, meeting great horsey humans, and hopefully learning a new thing or two about horses and yourself. Let's get started. Before we begin this episode, I wanted to share some news that is bittersweet. I have, through uh, my sense of intuition and just watching how the winds are blowing, it's feeling like it's going to be the final year for the Whole Horse Apprenticeship this year, which is now in its ninth year. So this is a big deal. And I wanted to make sure that anyone out there who had been thinking about this program in its current form, so six months, we have 24 guest instructors, four online courses, and it's really an immersion into equine well-being and horsekeeping. If this is something that's been calling to you, I don't want you to miss out. So definitely head on over to the website. The webpage for the course is www.alexalinton.ca slash whole dash horse dash apprenticeship and check it out and hopefully you can join us. And if you need a payment plan, there is a three month payment plan and I'm also open to other options if it's challenging to join and accessibility is an issue. So just reach out and we'll see what we can do. I hope I see you there. We start on September 15th and the deadline for registration is September 10th. Okay, now on to the episode. Enjoy. Hi everyone and welcome back. You're here for the Whole Horse Podcast. So glad to welcome you back today. This season has been amazing and today is no exception. I have someone that I actually met about five or six years ago in Canberra, Australia at one of her clinics and she just reminded me of this moment where she was grounding her feet on the earth and wandering around with the horses bare feet <laughs> barefoot in the in the arena and I was so moved and I like that that memory just stayed stayed with me until now and I'm, I've been reminded so I'm so pleased to welcome Belinda Bolsenbrook to the podcast and for us to get into all the amazing work that you're doing right now welcome Belinda Thank you so much, Alexa. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's so lovely to see you again yeah. after uh, after all this time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the universe was, you know, doing at that moment, but the fact that I was there in town at the same time that you were visiting, I was teaching at a at a spot of, for a client, uh, Leanne, who was taking your clinic. So I got to venture over with her, and I got to audit for a day. I just love to see the work that you were doing. It's sort of a bit of a jumping off point for me as far as looking into the classical dressage work and, and classical equitation, which has then since then been really foundational for me in in the work with my my own mares. And mm-hmm. I I wanted to just start by asking you about that passion, about that work. How did you find your way into to this this type of work you're doing, which is is quite, you know, specific and and dynamic, and also bringing in so many other pieces, like you just shared with the dissections and the movement science and the energy work and all these pieces. So how how did you mm-hmm. find yourself there? Well, I think that you know, I was I was in that way. I was very lucky because I come from a very horsey family, like generational horse uh, horse people in uh, in the Netherlands. And so um, I grew up with with horses, and I also grew up with uh, within a stud farm. We had like 
um, performance horses, like competition horses, but I also came from quite a classical background. And so that was also a big part of my upbringing. And I think that because it was such a part of my life growing up, it was also something that my parents were in that sense, really attuned to the animal like that is the horse and to nature. And I grew up in that way, like in the Netherlands, it's quite rare to grow up so much in nature as I did, you know, at this time, you know, before all the horrible things that we have now with mobile phones and everything and, and technology, I was just, you know, released in the forest every day. And I just learned how to play with my horses in the forest. And we were allowed to take, you know, take the freedom um, with that uh, growing up. I started, um, you know, started developing my own ways. And, uh, and my parents were always very much promoting that um, self-development. So I started, you know, um, my own horses under saddle when I was I think before 10 years old, I had my first, my own starts on the, on the smaller horses. And so I progressed from there. And, uh, and so I've always learned, or, or, and if I, I didn't discover it myself, I would have been corrected by my parents to work from a very consent based principle and to work from a classical principle, which means that you are in essence, classical means something that's beautiful to behold, right? Mm -hmm. Something that is in balance and that is attuned and that doesn't go in any way against what the natural um, abilities or the natural form is. And so as I grow up, I also, you know, had the opportunity to go into a very professional world with horses. I was um, internationally competing um, as, a, as a teenager, late teenager. And then I was really exposed to some of that, the cruel formats of horse training or the really, you know, forgetting about the soul of the horse and the uh, the approach is taken just purely based on some sort of circus and performance and that that developed me to become a trainer a teacher um, that was also you know in my family business and then ventured out on my own and as a, as a teacher yeah my biggest calling was probably to work for the well-being of the horses it always has been like I've just always felt that um, we have these amazing creatures with such a, a depth of their soul and such a forgiving nature, but also a very reflective nature. They are um, they are animals that can really open the the senses of humans, and so I felt that they need a voice. You know, they need someone to speak up for them, to make people aware, not in some sort of self righteous quest of like you know I know something that you do not, but also for my own development. Uh, and that's probably also why I, I ventured much further into the classical. I stopped uh, competing when I really dove into being a teacher. Being a teacher makes you a much better trainer, rider. It makes you also a much better person because you're continuously reflecting on empathy and on also the understanding that your mind and the way that you think is not necessarily the way that other people can uh, uptake information or the way that they see things. Um, and I love that part. I love that part of, of the human mind that we have the ability to, to, you know, look at all the intricate, funny, quirky and weird, but also amazing depth of the, of the human mind. This really fascinates me and it fascinates me and it drives me to have the ability to, um, to, to be able to reach out to somebody and open a world of understanding for them with their horses. Mm. And for that... I need to have a really deep understanding of what it is, uh, what we're doing with horses. So I always felt that all my theories and a continuous search for a deeper understanding should be reflected on, um, that I need to be fair, to be fair to the horse, to reflect also on my own theories and proof always continuously to myself, or at least question if what I am doing is in fact the right thing. So that is why I dove into um, biomechanics and I started uh, being a part of a dissection team and I do many dissections. And in itself, that's actually really quite a difficult thing to do because if you're a if you're a very connected person like I am with the, with the soul, then you can feel the hurt in the in the animal. And of course, we're not actually just taking a horse and just thinking, well, let's have a look at the inside of that. We're luckily not living in that renaissance anymore. Um, <laughs> we're not that Vinci's. We have to have a real 
a reason for having the end of a journey of a horse where it's just better that the horse is put to sleep. And um, and it's one of the things I really love about my dissection team that we're so ethical in the choices that we make in how the horse is also put to rest and, uh, and in the way that we go about researching and looking at the story of the horse and bringing that out into the world. And it certainly for me has made an enormous ability for growth in understanding why I do certain things or how they work and and how much that there is always if there's any misunderstanding with with a human to their horse or they think that the horse doesn't want to do something or it's just behavioral it is never just behavioral it's always in the body um, we were talking a little bit about that, about uh, translocating and stresses in the body. And, and if it is the chicken or the egg, which whichever one began first, but um, stress is stored in the body and it will have a physical effect on the body if it was, if it, if it's there long enough. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we find the, the right path to healing, then we actually uh, can overcome these things. It's for the horse as well. And they carry a lot of the stresses of humans, don't they? Like oh. um, they have to conform so much to what it is that we need. And we have so little reflection often in our horse world on what it is that they actually need. So that's uh, one of the, one of my passions that drives mm. me to, uh, to do what I do. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I, it's it's interesting the dissection piece has been really um top of mind i i have a, another girlfriend that is looking to start a bone room here on the lower mainland in canada uh western canada and just this sense of of seeing more and more evidence coming through of of the struggle of so many horses and i can only mm-hmm. imagine yeah, I, I haven't had the opportunity to to attend a dissection yet. I, I did attend one online, like over live stream. And even that I found incredibly powerful mm. to yeah. observe what was what was um coming up through what was being shown through the body, you know. Mm, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's better when you're online if you're you know, because you don't have to take on the herd just as it is. You still do, like you know, over a distance. But it is it is really intense to do the dissections. But it's also extremely beautiful. It makes you also much more in awe of the of the beauty of nature and how intricate and amazing we are as mammals, as creatures of this earth. How well designed we are, and also how how well designed we are to actually function really well. Like one of the things that I find fascinating in those dissections is, is that when we are seeing the body and we can see that perhaps there was an old trauma in a horse, how much the body actually is able to change and adapt to try and work with the mm. circumstances that it's given. And I think when it comes to healing and functionality of uh, of the body in life is that that is one concept that we just you know we're barely setting foot in even in human yep. science is that we always go from the idea that you know this is broken or this is dysfunctional mm-hmm. but actually when we are looking at the body and we can see where um, where trauma might have begun which could be just an outside force coming into you know into the body the body has to heal it has to deal with it how amazing the nervous system is at first responding and then saying through all of the fascial connections but hang on a moment this will not work like that we need to do this in a different way and the body will adapt the body will lay down tissue it will lay, lay down bone wherever it is needed to create better structures to still maintain a form of function in in life and that part of it if we think about it like that then it's not actually broken it's completely competent within that moment in time for what it is needed and maybe that is not exactly then as in when we're talking about horses and particularly riding horses we find that we then have um, you know a person will start to feel that that riding horse is not being able to do what is requested but that should send you on a journey of of what is going on and then to see how incredible the body has actually already been dealing with things to cope with what is requested that we then reflect on saying well then we were requesting the wrong thing we need to adapt and we need to come back to the very first foundation of healthy movement and comfort within the horse comfort relaxation movement and then when we're getting into that part of it we find that 
even when there's been uh, many adaptations in the body to maintain some sort of function, it can also be taken away. Whatever is put in the body can actually be, be healed and be released and become once again functional like we need it for our riding horses. And, and that's, that's what we would call a rehab journey. Mm -hmm. um, and for most people, once they start to find those answers and know where to go with it then uh, then that actually in itself becomes the most beautiful journey because you know let's be honest there's very little people that have aspirations to go to the olympics or to become a top athlete like our images of what we think we want with horses are so distorted to what we really truly look for when we start to feel love for the animal want to spend time with them so i think that's the uh, that's a really cool journey and certainly yeah the dissections are a, a really important part of of this development of training because they give us a way to show that what we feel is right or that yes. the, the 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 realization that horses are so adaptable and so willing to give that that is actually true that it's not just a oh well you know you didn't communicate that right or this horse just doesn't want to do it because it's unclear on the language but that the very first question rather than thinking of behavior is to say why is the horse actually trying to tell me something what is going on in uh, in the in the body and that with that work also on a much larger scale also in veterinary science in you know all of the work that's been done on research on horse behavior and horse husbandry mm -hmm. one thing that obviously is close to your heart as mm -hmm. well is, is that we actually can show that we need to adapt and we need to change now that we are starting to gain that knowledge that we can do so much better in uh, in our whole world of horses in our mm. horse communities make their life a whole lot easier uh, to manage and uh, and find as much joy in it as we have with spending time with them absolutely absolutely mm. i wrote down a few things and one of the things that i wanted to chat about was this idea this is an intersection that really really fascinates me and i think probably many of my listeners as well as the the intersection between physical and psychological health when it comes to horses or mental health when it comes to horses. And you've already touched on this in terms of, you know, when a horse is showing us, telling us something, believe them, right? Like I know for myself, I've, I've dealt and you probably have as well with chronic pain and, and injuries and, and things like that. I know that who I am when I'm in a, in a flare up of, chronic pain. I'm not my best self. <laughs> you know, yeah, let's just put yeah. it that way. I'm very grumpy. I, I'm shorter in temper. I'm, I'm less able to regulate myself, you know, more tipped. My scales are tipped much more easily. And I don't always see that we give that so much grace to horses around that piece you know, mm. of like, why mm -hmm. is, are they behaving this way? Why are they showing up in this manner? You mm. know, and because they can't speak to us, this sense of, okay, are are we really taking into consideration the things that could be happening in, yeah. their, in their being, in their body? Yeah, I think yeah. that it's, um, I, it's very tricky because, you know, it's already tricky within ourselves, like yes. to define for yourself that you're not in your best place when you're actually uh, hurting, when your body's not well, um, that you then also are psychologically like so affected, emotionally so affected. And I mean, again, it is a survival uh, mechanism of the of the body to say, well, you know, all of the all of the nice stuff and fluff around is not important. You need to focus on you for a moment. You need to actually make sure that you survive. My, the body is in stress. It's time to get rid of all of the things that aren't so necessary and attune to what you really need to do. You're on you're on the wrong track. Stop putting it outside of yourself mm -hmm. and bring it back to yourself. Now, for horses, it's very much the same. And and because they also they live in a in a world where they are I mean much better than we are uh, mostly able to. They live in a world where they're very much in the moment, which means that they are they're so 
well attuned to their environment, to themselves, to what's around them. And they live every essence of the moment so much deeper. I always wonder if it is in a way of years or experiences that, you know, one day in the life of a horse might mean much more like 20 years for us because we're so bad at updating our our right now moments. Like we're just, you know, we're always fluttering off and using our using our words to destroy the feeling in a way, I guess. Mm-hmm. But uh, But for horses, therefore, it's also a stacking problem. They are just coping with what is presented to them, uh, what is what put on them by their humans. And so it is a stacking of discomfort that then comes to a point where there's no more, uh, there's no other way out than to actually um, start to show disruptive behavior. And then when that behavior starts, or perhaps, you know, if you have a young horse that already had a sort of a problem, if it is with uh, within the psychological uh, sphere, or if it is a, a physical thing, um, either one will always be interconnected. But that uh, it's scary for humans because it is a big animal and most people do not grow up with, with the animal and they're uncertain to what it means. So they are uncertain to every language to what it means. And the small language is just not seen. Like the the because horses have an incredibly intricate and beautifully highly developed language. I'm quite loving also the the uh, the new ventures into you know looking at mm-hmm. uh, languages and and the the frequencies of languages and that we're also we're just not hearing like most of it. And that that's always been sort of yeah like whatever that's just you know floaty stuff that's not true. But we're now right now science is really going into that direction. And what a wonderful world it will be when we actually learn that horses have that full capacity for language language in the wider community and so when you're not listened to as a horse in your language when it's always just disregarded and really with their humans living in a parallel universe where there's like things that we can sort of understand and therefore there's these structures of behavior of how to put a halter on how to bring it to a tie up how to do this or that that but all of the small things where the horse will actually stand and move one foot to let you know that that shoulder is actually not comfortable, to let you know that um, when they're moving an ear or just turning a head a little bit, that something is worrying them within their body, that those things are not listened to. And so it then has to become like kind of a disruptive big, big. music language. Yes. Um, that gets scary for people because they feel they feel scared and overrun. And so then the first thing that you go to is try and implement a way of dealing with it or just coping like an abusive relationship. Yep. <laughs> and we'll just like cope with the situation and just try and plaster bandage what's going on. So I think that's that's something that we need to bring into the world of people with horses is that people learn much better from the beginning to um, start listening to the horse i think that really everybody that wants to have a horse should spend time in a natural herd and just sit there and be aware and listen and attune and just without their own reflections and who they are and how important it is that they get this right now at this moment if they if everybody would spend time in that kind of situation that atmosphere oh my goodness how much would that help in the communication with the animals and then uh, and then moving on from that the ability to then learn to just look and to take in what you see and without then starting to think like oh what do i need to do with that perhaps to just acknowledge because when we start right at the bla- place of acknowledgement then we start at the base of consent in training and working with our horses and when we do that Acknowledgement is often already enough. Just touching the horse on the place that draws you, that makes you aware that the horse is presenting it to you as a place of hurt, which could be emotional, can be physical, but that touch, the ability to just take a moment and stand there and touch the horse, and also not to just touch the horse like a violation. That's one thing that I see so much in just, you know, an everyday horsemanship culture is that uh, we'll just, we're just going to go and um, brush the horse. And when the horse has done a good job, we're going to just like pet it on the head. It's like, oh, I would say 
probably every horse that I know does not like to be petted between the eyes on the head. It's just something that they learn to deal with because oh, that's how humans like to do it. Like, mm -hmm. And uh, if you have that kind of, if we would start at the basis of, you know, uh, of bringing that knowledge to people, it would be really, really wonderful for both horses and humans, yeah, to mm. work with. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the subtleties are so important. I think mm. really, I think that, that focus on more and more and more awareness. I noticed that with my one mare where we've been working with even saddling up and just noticing I lift the saddle pad towards her. She turns her head away, lift the saddle pad towards her, turns her head away, you know, and it's like, huh? Yeah. That's enough feedback for her to be saying, yeah, I, I don't feel great about that. Mm. I don't feel great about that, you know? And mm. okay. Then how, then we, we got to back this train up a little bit, right? Like mm -hmm. we've got, we've got some other foundational work to do mm -hmm. before, you know, we get into the saddle and do other things. Right. And and just taking a moment too. I actually really liked it. You touched on that because it's one of the things that I bring into the foundation, uh, the foundation courses that I've set up now is that those kind of languages, what they actually, what they mean, because a lot of people would not even see that, that the horse turns away or that when you're doing something difficult and you're stopping um, when you're working in hand or at liberty, doesn't matter. And there's a moment that you've done something that's, you know, a little bit more intense or it was more interesting to the horse as in a more of a challenge to the horse and you stop and the horse looks away that so many people think that when a horse looks away oh they don't want to be with me they just uh, they're just or they're being rude they are disinterested right. Yeah, but that actually when horses do that in nature they do that all the time a horse never a horse it reminds me always like it's a little bit of an off track but it's like you know the lord of the Rings story with the ends like the the talking trees like horses are like that they like to they like to flow and they just like to go bada boom like, you know <laughs> sit, in, sit in the space for a little bit and so when they look away often that is what they're that what they just need a moment mm -hmm. they need a moment to feel and uh, and it's quite amazing when we're working on horses on their postural development I've I've worked obviously a lot with a big part of my job is with um, severe rehabilitation horses mm -hmm. mentally and physically and the, the therefore my work also with the nervous system both the emotional and, uh, and the physical uh, side of that but horses need to feel in their body and they do that much better than we do so when we're talking about holding disruptions holding parts of pain and locking that into our body somewhere when we start to work in the flow of motion and we see this in um, human therapies a lot too when we start to create flow of motion and dynamic movement and we become aware of movement and release and alignment and that brings self-carriage and when we're bringing that into the horse and we give the horse after an exercise the moment to process and to find the feeling in their feet it's quite amazing the first time we give this to the horse when a horse has been trained in the more conventional ways and had, there's been a lot of suppression uh, yeah. suppressed feeling and and compromised training they could take uh, three minutes to mm -hmm. to actually go through that processing but when you leave them for that moment and you're just holding the space so you're not physically activating you you're not standing there like well when are you done processing but you actually just leave that moment be you will find that they always follow the same pattern it's amazing how they put it through their body mm. they'll stand they'll feel it in the feet going to the earth they'll come back into their own body they'll send it through the entire pathways throughout the body they'll come back again and then you'll see them they go and have a little and then they'll step in one shoulder and then they'll step in the other shoulder and then they'll move a feet and then they move the other feet and they're really and that is a feeling implementing change in the body and they let go and they're ready to move on and how amazing when we when we do that that you can you can heal and provide provide places to work so well together within one two sessions the whole world changes and you will lose all that anxiety but also even in form just teaching a horse to do you know like creating piaf in a horse creating the higher uh, exercises of collection um the same thing 
teach it in that way, bring it into that way, experience it that way for the horse. And after the first time, they already know how to get there the second time mm. because they have time to put it into the body and feel it. And that's really cool. Taking moments for processing is probably one of the most powerful tools to better communication with I love, horses. I love that because I, I have a colleague that calls it like, making sure you put the period on the sentence right it's like that that idea of like yeah. just stop for a second and yeah, let yeah. it settle you know yeah I, I think as well I think for us are we are actually the same and one of the reasons that people are so unwell today is because we're continuously overrunning that system but getting taught in our societies that there's no time for that that you are you're not allowed that or you're not worth that uh, moment of uh, reflection and to just sit there with whatever we do and it's so much more healthy for ourselves as well so yeah it's a good it's a good thing to practice with the horses i love that the the you know in osteo we were taught specifically with each technique you do a specific a local and a global integration right and it's that sense of if if the body can't feel and acknowledge the change then has the change even happened right mm -hmm. because it's not been sort of sent out tried on by the system yeah absolutely yeah. then you haven't been able to to bring it to bring it through the horse the, or the horse has not been able to actually feel it and actually give it a place which means they can't move forward from that either so it's very accurate in uh, in my feeling in my theory that that there is no other way that we actually if we do something it, we have to give time for feeling that and grounding it and and, and giving it a place and that's a, that's a really beautiful part of of healing work, of rehabilitation work, is that, you know, if we can restore the right information at the right place at the right time, that's quantum healing, then all healing is possible. And that's, um, that is therefore also what we try to achieve. But it's only the other creature, if you're trying to work, work on the body of a horse, like when it's in osteopathy, it's the horses, essentially, that is the, you are just providing the the right information at the right time in the right place if you're very good at what you're doing mm -hmm. but you're not the one that actually takes that information and does something with it that's up to the horse and um and we can't force that it's like any relationship you can talk your you can talk someone's ears off but if you're not using the words that emotionally hit home for another person you're you can talk all you want it's not going to happen <laughs> so you know that's the same for uh for of course i work with animals as well so with humans is that we need to we need to take it outside of ourselves and make it just just about uh, wanting to do the right thing for that creature that beautiful animal in front of you mm. Which gives us a whole part of healing in itself, which is quite wonderful. I was going to say, less important. <laughs> there's so much healing in that because to me, what I'm thinking of is how many horses have lost the joy of movement, the joy of play, the joy of being in their body in a creative way, mm, right? Yeah. You see this all the time, just horses that just don't, they're just so bottled up inside themselves. And yeah. I think those spaces allow themselves to go, oh, that actually felt really good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. nice, right? Mm. Mm. I really like that you mentioned that because I find that is probably one thing that I find where horses hurt the most is that we take all of the playful elements out of the training of horses. And, and you know, I am a very educated rider. Like I can, I've, I train horses to the high school levels of all of the exercise. I train horses to Grand Prix. But that what we see today is in Grand Prix dressage is overall just a pop puppeting, a puppet show. And and the training that we implement on horses, and particularly even in the, in the areas where um, people are trying to do the right thing and try to use scientific approaches to create a one, two, three step for people to learn. Well, when the horse does this, this is what it means. And this is how you should respond. Mm -hmm. Is that you take away all of the real communication. And for that, the, the horse will cope and they will learn 
to just deal with it and shut down. But we take away all of the playfulness and horses are extremely playful. They're really, mm. they love playing and they love feeling the experience because they live so much in the now. And so if we can bring training to people where they can still achieve and so much better achieve because it's a real achievement to then get to a level of competence in your language with your animal and yourself in your own body's capacity because this has got to do with your own balance and your own self-carriage and movement to then start to create all of the shapes and all of the language to do do a grand prix dressage test and do really well at it but that it has the element of play that we never never lose that element of playfulness is so important and it's difficult Because when we're right at the beginning of consent-based training, we start right at the beginning with a youngster. It's not difficult for the horse because we have so many centuries together with this animal. Mm -hmm. They do not care if we sit on their back at all. So one thing I noticed, I've never, ever had a horse feel that it is frightening for a person to sit on their back with the with the right preparation they don't feel at all there's an invitation of that but what's very difficult and very unnatural is that the moment that that person gets on the back is that we start to implement restrictions and aids of like bridles and reins and saddles and aids to tell the horse now you must put your foot right here This is where we're putting your foot. And now we're going to put that foot there. And this is how we're going to make this shoulder in and this half pass and this pirouette. And that's really, really restrictive for uh, for any creature. Just imagine that someone would just tie you in ropes and then just start pulling on these ropes and bump you around and tell you, well, it's really nice that you are alive, but you are my slave and you are just going to do it this, this way. Now, It made me struggle for a long time, particularly with the dissections added on to that, that knowledge of the damage that gets done for most horses in their lives. The, the hardest thing of the dissections is, is that we sometimes we can find the, the the deepest trauma, the first trauma, like a fracture or something mm -hmm. like that, or mm -hmm. a birth trauma or something like that. And then because the horse was not understood, follows years of implemented trauma on top of that first trauma because not being understood and being told to just suck it up and do the next thing. But the only reason for that is not because the person didn't want to do the right thing. It's because they didn't know the language and that horse had learned to just say no, that there was a place when you're right at the beginning of training that we actually can be told that it's not the right question at that time that when we're starting to ride a young horse that it's okay if they sometimes in this place of playfulness that they say well let's go this way and that it's actually in the skill of the trainer to say oh what a brilliant idea let's go and do that that's really fun and that you keep that kind of short playfulness the the session short the playfulness there the autonomy there to let the horse sometimes decide where we would like to go and then to play around with saying but you know we could do it this way too And the development out of that is that the horse will willingly have fun with you to do all of the things that we actually desire. So we still get, and even much deeper, get what I call a war horse. And although war is not a great concept, I, I say, do you have a war horse or a work horse? Because a work horse is just a slave and it can be really safe to ride, but it actually is living in four wide walls and it has very little freedom within that and it's just coping. And then we have a war horse and a war horse is the horse that slept with the Roman soldier in the same house and that actually was brought up to be a part of the experience of the communication. We can still actually create it. And then we have a horse that will always stay with us no matter what the circumstances. So it's safer, it's a deeper experience, it's an amazing journey to take with our horses. Mm. 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 That's that segues perfectly into something that I was super curious about on your website, which is this study you've done around the historical context of the the horse human relationship so the journey that we've had with horses over centuries and how it relates to in a positive and negative way probably to how we're interacting with them now can you share mm -hmm. a little bit about some of the the sort of work study that you've done in this area 
Well, because it's always an interesting journey. It's like, it's one of those things that I said before, like to reflect on why it is that we do certain things, like to take it back from back, uh, from front to back a little bit is that what we have today, our experiences today are also quite diverse when we're looking at, of course, now it's becoming super intermingled because we have the world wide web and we have everything so accessible to us, which is also the brilliant thing because we're starting to get into a journey of this sort of deeper understanding and the wish for a new renaissance and a new level of, uh, of, of togetherness with our horses. But if we're looking at not that long ago, say 15, 20, maybe 30 years ago, then look at the, 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 the trainers that were out there and what they were sharing is their experience. Also as good horsemen or people that were trying to do something new, there's many trainers that are working particularly, for example, in the field of natural horsemanship. Mm-hmm. They come, where did they come from? Like the people that try to make the the experience for horse and human better that started to talk about animal communication, not as much in depth or on the in the atmosphere that we're talking about, but like in in the just implementation of yes and no questions, etc. Right. And a lot of these people come from much rougher upbringing, much rougher directions. Like if you were a cowboy that got brought up with with horses being tied down in ropes and put on the ground, and then that's how they started being broken in. Mm -hmm. And you take that and develop it into working with carrot sticks and flags, then you have done a really good job already. And maybe compared to a person in Europe that has been brought up in Portugal in a place of Uh, horse culture that is like uh, so alive still today of a part of you know a a part of a macho culture so there is a a harsh interaction with the horses and it is part of daily life but because it's been part of daily life in uh, in an essence of bullfighting of direct interaction with another animal where there's no time to start to round the horse over the pole and like make the horse leg yield it's an interaction of two beings being like one they have to actually survive that moment as very close to the war horse like we know it the overall practices the daily practices of the horses are not tying the horse down because we need the horse as a free thinker and so it's a very different different culture and although the free thinker is still being taught to just suck it up it's probably in the culture of humans as well like when we're looking in a macho culture we have the same education from boys becoming men and you know and it's a reflection if that's actually a good thing or if that also creates a, a disharmony and a and a, you know something that's dysfunctional so but in its essence coming from that direction that person looking at the person that works with a flag is thinking what the hell are you doing <laughs> like why <laughs> this is so this is so um this is absurd and so when we're looking at the very first part of you know our our being together with horses we were probably like you know just starting to we were probably just living in nature with these animals and we were tracking and following because we were hunter gatherers. Mm -hmm. And so we're moving with the animal very much like you could see in an African savannah today that even the, 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 the animal that gets eaten by the other animal quite um, lives together in quite a lot of harmony when it's not time for the hunt and it's not time for the, for being eaten or, you know, or running away fast enough. And so I think that that togetherness, the shared experience was really, really close. And that's evolved into all sorts of different directions of horsemanship and training as we needed it. I find it really fascinating to look at that because even in the classical works that we have today, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. we're looking at the, um, the the works that are still there that we can still read. And um, I love seeing the differences in the approaches, the similarities. And those similarities are because they are just the foundations of good horsemanship. And they're everywhere the same, no matter where you are in the world. And no matter if you look at Asian traditional culture, culture um, with horses or you're looking at um, the Bedouins or you're looking at um, the uh, American culture, you're looking at the European culture, they're, they're very similar. And then comes all of the other things. How did the horses get kept? What kind of environment mm-hmm. did they grow up in? So what kind of horses were bred? Because one tradition is also more um, suitable 
to train a certain particular type of horse. And this goes on the physical, like the conformation of the horse and the natural capacities of the horse, then another cultural experience. And so that in that way, which is for me also very fascinating, is that we can't always uh, make the same approach to training an animal just because a thoroughbred is vastly different than a Baroque horse. And so a French cultural tradition of, of bringing the horse onto the haunches and stopping the horse from moving forward too much could be detrimental to a German or a thoroughbred horse that's bred to actually run forward fast and cover uh, large amounts of ground at the time. And, and then we can bring those traditions into what is actually suitable to the horses today. So mm. that's a big interest of mine. And, and I like particularly in the classical works that um, those classical works were often written on a particular thought of that person on rehabilitation, on training the problems and what they did with the problems and how they work with that. And we have these senseless discussions on what the best way is when in fact there is uh, there is only one way and that is that what is right to the horse and in that way we can see very clearly there is the there's just the rules of nature what's the confirmation of your horse so what are the possibilities what's the compensation in your horse in uh, what you see physically and emotionally and and learning to define them gives you a way to move forward. Having the knowledge of the classical works of the classical masters of the history of riding gives you an enormous amount of, of, of depth of theory to then say, okay, well, this is why that person would have done it like that. This is why this tradition developed like that. And I could use this part of it in my work because it's suitable, but I would never use that on this particular horse because it doesn't suit the horse. So I like that a lot mm. in our training. Yeah, so not cookie cutter, so so entirely unique. Yeah, yeah, that's, there's so much more in there. I, I want to get a little bit into the horse keeping part of it because I just wonder if there's anything you see as a, a thread that runs through all of these horses like is there any needs or any pieces that support all of these horses in their movement in their Absolutely. health well-being psychological health all those things yes horses need social interaction it doesn't mean what it doesn't matter what the sex is if they're a stallion if they're a mare or a gelding um they need continuous social interaction they need little changes to their family herds if you can manage so if you take a horse you are if you would like to have a horse be committed like actually get try to be committed for a lifetime because it is one of the hardest things for horses to cope with is change of environment having to change their their families is really, really difficult. And movement, having the ability to always move to their grazers and they should they should always have the freedom for movement. Having horses locked into little yards where they have restricted movement is horrible for the animal. And it's definitely a big part of the damage that we see because they can't even walk off your uh your shared experience and it's fine if the shared experience is not perfect it's never going to be perfect but if you're a beginner rider and you're still quite crooked or you have a saddle that doesn't quite fit because you simply don't know that that saddle doesn't fit mm -hmm. um then your horse needs to have at least the ability to try and walk it off and so continuous movement is really important. And then the last one, and that's one thing that's particularly coming out with the dissections and uh, something I very, very love. Very recently, we had a horse that had the cervical malformation yeah. that a lot of research about. Yeah, and ECVM. one of the things yeah. that is so easy VM. And one of the things that is so uh, commonly spoken of with easy VM horses is that people are told that they're so compromised in all sorts of ways that it's kind of the death sentence, the end road of the horse. Whereas my experience is very, very different. I have many students with easy VM horses that if they're well managed, and particularly if we have, say that we would have easy VM likeliness in a young horse, if that horse would be brought up with unlimited, unrestricted movement, if it would be, uh, and I don't know, don't mean just a small field, but a field that actually is interesting to also move around in, mm -hmm. because otherwise the horse will still stand in the corner, because square paddocks are actually really desensitizing to the horse um, is that 
if that horse would have all of the ability for movement in space and have the ability for continuous roughage, that's one thing that I yep. really want would like to touch on if we're talking about yes, horses. Yes. That if you have if you have horses, so coming back to that easy VM and being told by so many people that are researching this that all oh, these horses they don't have the nutritional they don't have the capacity for the nutritional uptake is a lot is not true that is okay. not true that is just because of what we see in the dissections because these horses were already long given up on and so these horses were already not in the place they often didn't get the perfect care anymore and also they were stressed because things were requested of them that they could not handle because they had the the ECVM, the cervical malformation, but perhaps that malformation has gotten a lot worse because they were trained in restrictive frames with an ill-fitting saddle. And when they said, I can't hold you up because my connections are actually not created the way they should have been to carry a rider, um, they are pulled into a draw rein or pushed into a natural horsemanship technique that makes them move sideways very excessively. And so the things break down more excessively, the horse gets stressed, then it starts to develop ulcers, then it doesn't have the continuous rough itch because it's expensive to feed a horse. So we'll, we'll make do with just, you know, two slices of hay. And for the rest of the time, the horse is just, you know, standing around. One thing that I've seen with a couple of the horses that, well, many horses now, but with the horses that have had that care is their stomach lining on an ECVM horse is, is immaculate. Their internal health can be immaculate. They actually do not need to be that much suffering into that direction. That's purely because they haven't had the care that they need. And one thing of care for the horse, one thing that is also really diminishing stress for your horse is to have the ability to continuously eat yes. if they want to, is that just let them eat roughage and not just one type of hay. They need a variety because that's what they would have in nature. Yeah. They yeah. need a mixture of roughage so if they do not have that in the grass or if you're living like you know we have in australia in queensland or in any of the coastal areas on yep. the east coast it's very toxic grasses can really be not very healthy for the horse but if you then give them access to unlimited hay that they can just eat that is uh, just do does everything to the health of the horse that's one thing movement hay social interaction those are your three absolutely essential ingredients for doing the best for your horse and then you can actually afford to muck it up around some other areas of course preferably not but uh, we yes. can afford to not be the best rider and we can afford to make a few mistakes because those three ingredients will give your horse the balance and the foundation that they need to work well yeah mm -hmm. i couldn't agree more <laughs> It seems so simplistic, right? We were talking about your uh, your next venture before, but it it seems simplistic, but it's not, is it? Because it's so common that either one of them or two out of the three at least are missing. Absolutely. And I see it's one of the reasons why I've created my new business is that I I live on the West Coast in Canada and the, our, we have a rainforest climate, right? So it's, it's tricky horse keeping wise, but I've seen this continuous trajectory towards small sterile paddocks electric fencing horses kept on their own and very very controlled feedings and and it's created in in its own right an epidemic of health issues ulcers yeah, colics true. arthritis injuries because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of if i don't let my horse move then yes they are more prone to injury compensation things they like you say they can't walk it off they don't have the ability to move over different terrain or over different footing because they just haven't used their body in that way mm -hmm. yes Human yeah. uh, science is very clear on that. Motion is lotion. Motion is lotion. It's the same for us. And so for horses, that is absolutely the same. And even more so, I guess, because they are so much closer to their natural being as, as we are. But it's the same for us. It's one of the reasons we have so many health diseases on uh, humans as well. So we don't move enough. We are stressed because we don't get enough hugs. And 
and uh, we don't have enough social interaction in a good way. So we're and we're not putting the right food in our mouths. I mean, really, that's just it. It's very simple, and it's the same for horses. If you are not putting the right, if you don't present the right food to them, they don't have an option. Yep. And just imagine if you re if you understand the animal that the horse is, you would be horrified if you place your horse alone in a paddock and it doesn't matter if there are still horses around them that they can't touch possibly even worse just imagine that all you want is just touch to get rid of your stress levels mm -hmm. to get actually all you want is a good groom to feel better in your body so that someone can rub you in the places that are a little tender and you just cannot you can only look at that stupid electric wire and wish that you could wish it away one day and then hope that you know your person comes and gives you at least a nice groom but it's a terrible uh, situation that we think that that is something that is okay today that is something that is absolutely uh, that that's one thing that I would say that should be mm. uh, forbidden and uh, and if yes. people think that you know it is uh, it is more dangerous to get some superficial scratches from having a play together what you're doing to the internal health of your horse is so much worse by keeping them isolated on their own what you said about arthritis arthritic changes development and just chronic diseases because chronic mm -hmm. diseases are formed by chronic stresses and ulcers that we have colic that we have today um there's very physical reasons for not even just the emotional but the reasons that we have so many colleagues simply because the way that the abdominals hang in their beautiful facial sheets um, in the belly and that with every stride that the horse makes like a little rack of clo clothes hangers they are moving the guts around every mm -hmm. little stride with the head down and if the horse does that for so many hours a day when they're just moving and eating and moving and eating that is actually what creates internal health so um yeah that's so important touch and uh touch and food and movement yeah. much less the diaphragm you know when they're moving and the diaphragm's pumping yes exactly. and, and massaging all those internal organs it's just like it's mm. so important it's so important <laughs> it's I, uh, so yeah, important. <laughs> it's yeah. I, I was so yeah. ticked the other day I had a client message me and said oh do you think I can add a different hay for my horses she lives in Arizona so it's pretty far away she goes she's currently on you know one this one hay with one type of grass and I said, oh, yeah, like add something else, like add another low sugar thing. Absolutely. And she said, oh, my gosh, I, I didn't know you could mix hay. My mm. vet told me that my horse would colic. And I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's true, right? Like it's true because that's what people have learned. Um, yeah. But it's important to understand that that is just with your condensed foods. If you suddenly change um, from having grains to absolutely no grains. That's a significant change to yep. the internal digestive system. And so if you make abrupt changes like that, you can most certainly develop a colic. But the horse is meant to eat a variety of foods and we should try and give them the options and you will see that horses also go through stages and through the seasons like mm -hmm. uh, multiple choices of hay then you might think like oh yeah but if i give my horse like you know the grassy hay and there's lucerne they will always choose the lucerne it's not exactly true there might be a certain need for that but i can guarantee you that with horses that have hay at lip and I'm not talking about horses that have been fragile because there's an emotional yep. state to horses that have been too long deprived of continuous hay is that they will gorge and that they can yes. actually create a problem with weight out of that, which is why we can't just make a sudden change. Like, let's fix the problem. I'm going to give my horse, you know, unlimited amounts of legumes and, and grasses. Um, that's not how it works. But um, but if it if you do, if you implement it gently and well thought through, you mm -hmm. will find that those horses will not only just choose the high sugars, they actually will choose a variety of their feed. And if you have a paddock big enough with some varieties of grasses and you take notes, then you will see that the horses will move through the paddock in a certain way with different stages of light. And for example, coming from the first dew of the morning to the way that the evening sets and where they will graze and where they will rest. Mm -hmm. So they know very well how to pick what they need and it is tricky in horse husbandry in different places in the world particularly when we're talking about like the other varieties of uptake like herbal mm. uptake, like things that are helping for internal gut health 
What about browsing options, like you know the uh, um, the need for a horse and the ability, like for places where horses were are naturally come from, where horses naturally come from, they have the option for some things to you know let's have a little bit of willow because you know our yep, tummy is sore, exactly. or, um, and they will nibble on it, they'll look for it, they'll take some oat leaves for an upset stomach, like, and we don't have those options all the time, but I certainly try um, yes. in my environment to create that for uh, my horses too. I give them a whole variety of options and uh, and it's really amazing that at least when we get already 80 percent of the way of that we are very 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 well ahead of um, helping our horses be healthy and happy mm. Mm. yes i've i've been throwing willow branches in for my girls and it's <laughs> they love them and eating the bark and yeah, it's yeah. very healthy for them it's mm, wonderful it. mm. yeah it's very cool it's very cool. Thank you so much. We're nearing the end of our time together and it's gone so fast and this mm -hmm. has been, yeah, I've learned so much. I hope all of you listening have learned as well. Uh, Belinda, will you t share a little bit about, I know you've got some really cool things going on. Will you share a little bit about what, what you have happening? Yeah, of course. So, of course, like I've been like a, a world traveling clinician and I still do uh, do that too, like of uh, 27 years now. It's wow. amazing. But uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but I just uh, I just really wanted to take that to a new uh, platform. I started a few um, education systems over my lifetime and I've got amazing developed co coaches that started their own education platforms. And I thought we must bring in a place where this can all come together. So I started an academy uh, online and and in that academy, I have uh, a place where I educate uh, coaches and also researchers. There's a place where we do a lot of research and where we bring that research together, um, each in their own expertise. And then what I really wanted to do is to bring people possibility to give them the knowledge that is needed, the foundational knowledge that's needed to make good decisions for themselves and their horses. I think that one thing that, that I, I find over all those years of teaching is that so many people have all of the right intentions, mm -hmm. but they have so much wrong information at hand and when you're overwhelmed with information or you get the wrong information you become paralyzed if you don't know why you need to do something or you don't need to do something or what you need to avoid you go well I'd rather maybe do nothing and then or I'll continue on this road or this person I better listen to this because what else do I do and so I've developed uh, now as a starter to have some foundation courses that just to design to empower people with the essential knowledge so that everyone can make their own decision mm -hmm. the, the first one of the first courses is a fundamentals I call it fundamentals and it's probably not the best name because people think it is about how to tie a horse and how to put the rope on and all the things but it's actually the fundamentals that I feel are fundamentals and that one thing is, is how to train the horse with a level of autonomy without getting the problems that you then feel that you are not having it's a two-way communication that you're looking for which means that the horse needs a voice so that they can tell you when things aren't quite right and where you then can start to uh, find a way to go that is good and that mm -hmm. will help us mm -hmm. to better understanding and better capacity so that's part of the uh, fundamentals is consent training and and how you recognize what the small language is of the horse how you go over that giving time and processing then another part of the fundamentals is learning the uh, basic biomechanics of horses so that we have a basic understanding not everybody has to become an expert at locomotion but when you have a basic understanding of anatomy and how the body works you are able to see another part of these fundamentals on what is the compensation patterns in your horse where is your horse not doing so well where are atrophies or hypertrophies in the muscle and what does that tell you about the underneath and it sounds like a super complex topic and of course in a way it is but when you have a template, when you can actually look at something and you have a, an, a real ingrained understanding, a basic foundation yourself of what is good and not good, then you are all of a sudden having the tools to say, my saddle doesn't fit. 
Mm. And this problem that is arising with the behavior is because my saddle doesn't fit. And my saddle maker says that this saddle fits. But because I have a template, because I know the anatomy of my horse and I can see that my horse is actually falling away in certain areas, and I now know that it is this behavior is starting to arise of narkiness and playing up against the canter, I know that this saddle maker is not the right saddle maker. I need to find another one because this is not right. And so that's part of it. And confirmation as well, like because uh, if we understand the confirmation of every individual horse, if you learn how to assess it and what it means in the basic uh, form, but the essentials of that on, then you know how to find good posture in your horse and how to find good balance in your horse. And that means that you can start to train your horse to really help you and the horse to be capable, to be healthy, to even help rehabilitate problems in your horse. And so I have a couple of those. The other um, two that we now have are in-hand training because um, in the in-hand training, I can help people to actually come past the problems that might be there um, emotionally and physically Mm -hmm. and to really have the tools uh, together with the uh, other fundamentals to say okay this is where I'm going to go with my horse and then they can it's really amazing it's amazing to see the other one is on rider's seat and it works all on your own movement it's really not just like rider seat this is how you sit on the horse and this is where your leg should be but actually understanding what your influence is how to how to time your movement and your aids and why that is so that you have no more unclarity on how to do anything with your horse because you actually understand why it is now you might not be able to do it perfectly yet but that's why why also on my foundation of the rider seat is actually essential movement therapy for uh, humans just to learn how you're moving to start to recognize your own restrictions or compensations and then um, I use just a a few uh, different setups to help you to find your own space on where you are in good balance and where you are not hurting and where you're not restricted because there is a middle point for everyone where it can be functional and uh, and by doing that i've created this amazing like platform now and i'm now starting to bring in coaches that i've educated because it's growing um, really quickly um, and it's a place where people can then find also all over the world other experts not just in uh, as a trainer but also because i work a lot with veterinarians and scientists on on where to go if you for example would need your horse diagnosed with something or if you're having some issues somewhere that you that you need answers for and so it's also just a platform of connection and uh, and I hope to uh, to grow it out to uh, to a really yeah large uh, worldwide place where people feel that empowerment that's really my passion is to empower people with knowledge and make you feel like you are competent and that you actually know what you're doing. So no one no one can tell you the wrong thing and you will stick to your own beautiful journey with your own horses. Yeah. Mm, amazing. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. For those of you, those people that would want to head to your website, what's the what's your website right now? Just uh, Belinda Bolsenbrook Academy. So if you go to the Belinda Bolsenbrook Academy, you'll find me. And I'm obviously on Facebook and Instagram, etc. And you'll find find links to the websites as well. So yeah, yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. I'll, I'll include it in the show notes as well for those that are listening. And Linda, thank you so much for this amazing conversation today. You do, Alexa. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for a lovely, lovely chat. Mm, <laughs> mm, <laughs> wonderful. And thanks everybody for listening in and being here today. Hope you learned a thing or two and we'll see you next time for our next podcast. Bye for now.